For Crema Media, I'm Lumgilen Gompe. Joining me is Mate Group CEO, Dr. Meren Zarabini, here to discuss the state of rubber manufacturing in Africa and the latest developments in South Africa's tire recycling sector. What is your overall assessment of the rubber manufacturing industry going into 2024? And can you discuss the latest developments relating to rubber product recycling? Yes, absolutely. I think there's two aspects uh, to look at. One is obviously from a recycling uh, perspective within uh, South Africa. Uh, and I can give you some insight into what we are actually doing within the industry. And then obviously there's the valorization aspect as to what one does with the rubber crumb once it's been produced in a different kind of industries, certainly that we're involved in. Uh, from a recycling uh, perspective, obviously we have been involved in a number of years and been through the transition of uh, Redisa to the Waste Bureau uh, and so forth, whose, whose responsibility lies with uh, managing the waste tire management plan. We're in a, a, a different position to many other recyclers around the world in that we uh, utilize only radial truck tires um, for recycling. That's largely because of the technology that's implemented in our facility, but also because many of our clients demand uh, recycled rubber crumb from truck tires, especially for the applications in the industries which they serve, largely because uh, truck tire has a much natural, natural higher rubber content as opposed to a passenger tire, uh, but also it has a high steel content uh, which provides an additional revenue stream in, 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 uh, as well as just selling the rubber crumb. From a industry perspective, you know, COVID was a disastrous two years as it was for many manufacturing industries in South Africa. Uh, but the moment uh, January 22 kind of kicked in and we saw the restrictions easing, there was an uptake uh, to the use of rubber crumb. Now, primarily the, the two industries that have been uh, dominant in that space has been A, the, the roads industry in South Africa, uh, and B, it's been in the sports uh, industries. And when I talk about sports, it's used largely as an infill in artificial uh, synthetic turf for football, soccer, or it's used as an elastic layer underneath uh, artificial turf in uh, hockey uh, pitches. And we've seen in South Africa, uh, many schools compete uh, purely based on their, uh, not only on their academic facilities, but largely on their sporting facilities and their abilities to attract students. So there's been a growing demand of these new type of fields, whether it's been uh, football or whether it's been hockey, but it's been largely driven by the private sector. And that's been largely focused on developing many of the the hockey fields in South Africa. So we've seen a large uptake in the requirement of coarser rubber crumb for that kind of application. On the soccer side in South Africa, I have to say that, um, you know, post World Cup 2010, there was this um, uh, expectation that there would be a huge amount of, of uh, soccer facilities being developed throughout the country. And I don't think that has taken place at all. Many of the projects have been uh, maybe uh, developments that have taken shape in, in more previously disadvantaged areas and been sponsored by many of the larger corporates, uh, which is interesting because they have taken more of the rubber crumb that's been used. And it's a specific type of rubber crumb that's used in a full size soccer field. But we have seen from, from a Mate Group perspective within the African continent, there has been quite a large demand, uh, especially as you go up to Congo, uh, Mozambique, Congo, and even as far up as Ghana. And that's largely because there's been a lot of FIFA sponsored uh, full scale projects. In fact, again, a good example is a number of years ago, we did a project in Tanzania, and I think it was, um, we did eight full size FIFA fields. And each field, if you can imagine, takes about 100 tons of rubber crumb per full-size field. So that's a large amount of recycled tires going into those facilities. Unfortunately, I think in South Africa, there's a lot of more and more complication uh, resulting uh, with the tender processes and with SAFA and ultimately how those projects are funded. And there's often many delays. And then once they get the, the contractors get onto site, there's often delays with 
uh, the implementation of the facilities because of employment within the communities and strikes and so forth. So it's much more complex in South Africa than it is outside. So the other thing to point out, which I think is interesting, is in the European Union, we've seen a move away from rubber crumb in synthetic sports fields for the simple reason that rubber crumb has been deemed a microplastic. And there is a, a period of six years where it will be no longer utilized uh, in for soccer infill in particular it will be banned ultimately uh, using rubber uh, in artificial soccer fields is possibly the best application in order to simulate uh, ball bouncing and also the role of the ball but also in Africa we have this uh, problem where in Europe they don't have but we have a high uh, changes in in weather conditions seasonally high rainfall, which means that if you're using a natural infill, the product actually floats to the surface. So I think in South Africa, in, in the African context, we'll still see rubber crumb being utilized in such facilities. If we go then on to the other part of the industry wise, is rubber crumb being utilized in different kinds of industries? I can say that there has been an uptake, um, certainly in the molding industry. We also have a company that is active in molding and we mold a variety of different kinds of uh, products, whether it's equestrian products, whether it's ballistics products for shooting ranges, we manufacture a high quantity of uh, flooring products made from recycled rubber, which is tend to be used in the gym industry, uh, in the high performance sports industry, in the CrossFit industry. We also export a lot of those products, but there are some more unique applications that are utilizing a recycled rubber crumb and the interest is growing. For instance, non-slip paints, in coatings, in sealants, uh, it's even being used to manufacture rubber pads, uh, brake pads uh, for trucks. So the switch to recycled uh, rubber is slow, but there's certainly interest and there's certainly going to be greater uh, demand into the future. And that was always the difficulty when we started off was always trying to um, you know, find new ways of using rubber crumb. And I think that's been one of the key success factors from a Marte Group perspective in that there were, when we started in 2016, there were approximately 16 companies manufacturing or recycling tires. I think one of the, the, the kind of success factors that we've had as a group is that we have strongly focused on the valorization aspect of the value chain and not simply just been there to convert old and discarded tires into rubber crumb with the anticipation of selling it. And I think that's where we've been able to ride out the kind of seasonality uh, or bullwhip effect um, factors which affect this kind of industry. For a, a good example is the roads industry. It's seasonal. I mean, uh, most of these, uh, the demand for rubber crumb in roads tends to be towards the end of the year. Similarly, in the sports industry with the private schools, they have a budget to spend, they have uh, recreational facilities to upscale before the end of the year, before they bring back students into the new year. So if you're able to valorize a product within your own group, as well as sell to external customers, you're able to um, kind of move away from the bullwhip effect of these demand variabilities, which mean you're able to consistently uh, sell product to internally, but also to external customers and ride out uh, any kinds of problems that you'll face with, with demand into the future. So I think that's a very important uh, aspect of tire recycling. Like I said, you know, there were 16 companies when we started. I think we down to one or two companies 2024 in South Africa. And that's a problem because it's not only a problem as to many of these companies being sustainable, but it's also a problem as to how attractive is the industry to get into into the first place. And I think that brings, you know, a, there are a number, there's a high amount of friction for any company wanting to enter into this space, whether it's capital funding. Uh, for capital funding, you need to have the necessary supply agreements for raw material, but you also have to have the necessary offtake agreements with customers as well. And the difficulty involved in getting either of those two is a challenge. The other thing is having things like, uh, you know, if you're a large enough entity wanting to get into this space, 
you have to have a waste management license, how easy it is to get that. Uh, we've, we've obtained recently a second waste management license for a second facility. The process takes about uh, anything between 12 and 18 months before you're even allowed to bring in uh, equipment to start your facility. And there's a huge cost associated with getting the necessary permits in place to be able to do that. So, you know, the, these are the type of um, challenges that any incumbent will face getting into the industry. And I think that one of the other one is, is that around financing. How do you finance, um, you know, the purchase of this capital equipment, whether it's a few million dollars or a few million euros, if you're looking at a large scale uh, facility uh, and having access to that finance, but not having supply agreement, not having offtake agreement in place. No financial institution will look at you if you don't have all these types of things uh, covered uh, in order to fund uh, the purchasing uh, of equipment. Plus having the necessary infrastructure in place to receive tires, check tires, process tires, manufacture the raw material or the end product, and then be able to distribute it and have the logistics. It requires a, a reasonable size facility to be able to do that. And I think that's been a problem for many entrepreneurs who have wanted to get into this space in South Africa for a number of years. Are there the support mechanisms from government in place to incentivize uh, tile recycling? Uh, the government would no doubt say there are, but I think the realistic challenges out there are profound and that results in a high amount of friction uh, to come into this industry. To what extent do these industries contribute towards the growth of South Africa's economy? Further, please comment on the success or lack thereof implementing some measure of circularity in the rubber manufacturing industry. Yeah, so I, I think in terms of uh, growing in the economy, we know that tyres in South Africa are a major problem. Uh, I mean, if you only have to look at some of the data that the Waste Bureau has put out, albeit it's, it's very old, it's, it's 2018, uh, information, but they talk about 300,000 tons of um, waste tire material available for uh, recycling or repurposing. You know, back then, I think they had accounted for a maximum of 50,000 tons. So there's still a long way to go in terms of, you know, ridding South Africa of this waste problem. But, you know, it talks about uh, kind of eliminating these friction issues for more entrants to come in. But I think if there was uh, less friction, uh, it would certainly contribute to the economy far greater than what it is doing now. I mean, I'll give you a good example. You know, within our group, we employ around about 250 people. 98% um, of them are employed from the community of Hammersdale in which we operate. So imagine if you could have many many more entities uh, like ourselves plus from a valorization aspect of utilizing this product in different kind of industries and incentivizing the use of recycled rubber material in all these types of industries how much more employment could there be so i think you know we, we're doing things on a small scale but i think ultimately there is opportunity to, for it to contribute far greater to the economy than what it is doing now, I mean, there's, there's the logistics involved, there's the, uh, the, the people who are collecting the waste material to bring it to the, the various depots, So, and there's all the industrial factors involved. So I think, you know, it's still on a very much small scale, but the opportunity for it to become a much greater contributor to the economy is there. I think, you know, often when, when entities or, or consumers look at recycled content, they, 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 the first thing that comes into their mind is that it's far cheaper than, than virgin material. It's not always necessarily the, the case. You know, a tire is not something which is easily broken down into its constituent parts. I mean, it's, it's designed to be unbreakable. That's why we, uh, you know, from a safety uh, factor, when you're driving a vehicle on the road, it's not meant to be easily recycled. So there's a lot of amount of work and energy and power that goes into breaking that material down but you know we, we deal with companies in the uk we export a lot of molded product to the uk and if i look at the uk legislation for instance one of the areas that we work is is, is in uh, acoustic uh, flooring uh, for high-rise buildings especially I'm, I'm in london at home at the moment so uh, in many of the high-rise buildings in the city of london you have very stringent legislation 
where they demand that recycled products are utilized in the development or the construction of those buildings as opposed to virgin products. So from a circularity perspective, there's legislation which is driving the demand uh, of these types of acoustic uh, solutions. And rubber naturally has a great acoustic um, properties. So they're utilizing the construction of these high rise buildings in the place of, of uh, virgin uh, material. So, you know, from a circularity perspective, there needs to be the push from uh, government that demands that more recycled uh, material is utilized in different industries. But also we must be more innovative from a product development perspective and look at where the opportunities lie uh, to manufacture more unique and kind of differentiated product uh, that can be utilized in the place of virgin material. So I, I think, you know, it can't be just driven from uh, a producer or manufacturer, it needs to be, there needs to be that uh, push or pull rather from uh, government to say that, you know, the utilization of recycled uh, material in certain industries, whether it's in construction or whether it's in paving material around government buildings, it needs to be there to support uh, the in the industry as well. But also the products that we manufacture are fully recyclable at the end of their useful life because for instance in a some of the trials that we've done i'll give you an example in a hockey field a hockey field normally lasts for eight to ten years and you've used uh, to make underneath you've used this uh, rubber crumb to make the elastic layer underneath but what typically happens at the end of that eight to ten years the artificial grass is taken away whether it's donated to another facility but you're left with the elastic layer at the bottom of that what, what do majority of companies do? All they do is they lift up that material and take it uh, to landfill. I mean, that is that doesn't solve the environmental aspect. We're just creating another environmental problem. But what we've been recently able to do is actually utilize some of that material. And we've done trials and we're now looking at the commercial viability of doing that. But actually to bring that material back to our company as a tire recycler, but also uh, to recycle that material and then utilize it to the manufacture of different molded products as well. So we have, you know, this 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 kind of full uh, circle going on where it's being uh, used, recycled material is being utilized to manufacture products. At the end of its useful life, it's being able to be brought back to the recycler to be recycled again and then repurposed into the manufacture of another product. And I think that's the kind of thinking that we uh, require uh, going forward, but requires a lot of in innovation in that space. Considering the product and equipment trends within the rubber industry, how has the advent of technology shaped the tire recycling process? Yes, yeah, so, so technology is um, uh, very important. And I think, um, you know, the, it, it depends on what your budget is in terms of purchasing equipment and the type of technology you employ. I mean, you can buy the most advanced, uh, beautiful equipment from uh, some European or US manufacturers, but it'll cost maybe for a similar size plant that we have maybe 10 million US or, you know, six or seven million euro. But you could get a similar, similar type of facility from the Far East and it will cost uh, a lot less. However, the type of technology that you utilize is certainly not on the same scale. Uh, from an energy efficiency perspective, which we know is a major problem uh, within South Africa at the moment, um, you know, you'll have a far more automated and more energy efficient plant um, specified from Europe and US, simply because we know the cost of energy in those regions is very high, and also the requirement to utilize labor is much lower, so they have to be uh, have a much much kind of more advanced technology implementation than we would if we were buying equipment from the from the Far East, for instance. But uh, you know, uh, things are advancing uh, quite dramatically. One of the things that we've done in our facility is uh, to counteract you know the escalation of energy costs going forward is to replace a lot of the old equipment with much more energy energy efficient equipment. Uh, but also we've implemented a uh, solar PV system. So we have 1,580 kilowatt solar panels on our uh, roofs. Uh, we have three buildings uh, and that's generating up to about half a megawatt uh, of power, uh, which is, you know, 
which is utilized in our recycling process because it's so highly energy efficient. So I think the technology um, is not only associated with just the plant, but it's also associated with the kind of, uh, you know, the utilities that you utilize uh, as well. But it's advancing continuously. Um, and I think, you know, going forward, you know, the ultimate process to break down a tire is still ambient grinding. That, that is not changing, but the equipment that's been utilized to do it more efficiently, more quickly, uh, generate a higher output, um, utilizing less uh, labor, that is continuously on, ongoing. Are there any projects or agreements that are currently being undertaken or that have been completed by the Mate Group and within the sector? Yeah, so so we work, um, I mean, many of the <coughs> road development projects uh, we're working on currently in <coughs> South Africa and I think to some extent in, in Southern Africa. And these tend to be, we don't obviously work directly with Sanral, but we work with um, many of our customers who are involved in the bitumen asphalt industry. So we're working on a large number of those projects. Uh, and that's been going, you know, since post COVID, since everybody came back to work kind of thing. So, yeah, a lot of those projects have been realized now. And the, as more and more of those tenders are realized, we will engage further and work on those projects. Um, in the sports industry, uh, we're continuing to work with many of our customers, whether it be in South Africa or outside uh, of uh, both in the SADC region and beyond all the way up to Ghana. There's a large number of, of projects. Obviously, there's, I, I think, a lot of um, uh, projects happening because there's quite a number of elections taking place in, in African countries. So infrastructure spend all of a sudden becomes uh, important in many of those countries. So we're working in those regions as well. Yeah. So we have a number of other projects that we're, we're looking at. Um, and that is in the energy space, whether we are able to create more uh, renewable energy from tires itself uh, going forward. We're certainly having a, a look at that and that's some of the things that we have. But ultimately, I think for us, we're looking at expanding and we have expanded um, in the last year. Uh, and that's the reason why we kind of went um, and applied for a new waste management license in conjunction with the existing one that we have, and that is to expand our facility in, in Hammersdale. We have the room, it's a 70,000 square metre site, so it's a large facility, and we recognise the importance of uh, circularity and sustainability, and it's something that we're very much focused on. What sort of challenges has the sector experienced in developing products from rubber and recycling? Yeah, I mean, I think besides the uh, you know, the, the, the frictional challenges that I mentioned before with with developing new products or trying to innovate, um, there is always this challenge of how costly is it to market and develop? Um, and, you know, ultimately, how, do, how what is the offtake going to be? And I think, you know, that's that's where the difficulty lies is. Is it a, a substitute product? Is it complementary to some existing products that are already out there? And will the business or consumer, you know, be happy to go for a recycled product in place of a, of a virgin product? And I think, and also bearing in mind that the cost is not always similar. For instance, we manufacture uh, rubber paving material. Um, and if you look at the cost of that versus the cost of a concrete paver, there is no comparison. It's impossible that the rubber paver is going to be on par to a general concrete paver. But we've got to focus on where the value addition lies. And I think that's very important for companies in this space is look at where the value innovation lies, because there are certain areas where a rubber paver is, is much better than a concrete paver. For instance, if you're looking at uh, old uh, people's homes or developments where they have pathways they could utilize a rubber paver not a concrete paver for impact resistance for falling so that they don't damage themselves cycle paths cycle lanes that kind of thing so you have to identify where the the value innovation lies and pursue that direction because if you compare just one product with the other that's where the difficulty is and that's where the kind of spend is required in terms of 
marketing and trying to convince businesses and consumers that this is a viable product in the place of of any other product. So, so it's a challenge and it's always going to be a challenge, especially when the industry is kind of in its infancy. If you go across uh, to the United States, for instance, I have a book that I uh, downloaded from the internet, internet which was uh, from the state of California. I think the date was around about uh, 2005. And it was 200 pages thick of product and companies that were utilizing recycled rubber material. If I bring that back to 2024 in South Africa, if you could fill 10 pages, that would be uh, a lot. So the challenge is there, the opportunities also there. It's just a matter of how quickly can we get these um, products uh, developed and recognized in the marketplace that they uh, become either a substitute or complementary to other products that are not from recycled rubber material. It's as simple as that. To what extent has environmental awareness reconfigured the status and development of the sector? And can you describe what suitable methods are in place to reuse waste materials? Yeah, so, so I think from environmental awareness side, I think, I mean, it, it's so obvious um, that tyres pose a huge problem for South Africa. I mean, previous, prior to any legislation being in place, all those tyres ended up in landfill. I mean, it was simple as that. They, there was very little being recycled, possibly repurposed or possibly taken across uh, the border um, illegally. That in no doubt uh, happens. But I think the awareness is there because we get inundated with inquiries as to um, yes, so many tires dumped in certain areas. What are we going to do about it? Uh, unfortunately, the government is not doing enough about it. So the awareness is there, and I think consumers are, are really aware of the impact they're having. Plus, they're, they're also aware that there is a uh, levy that they're paying for changing their, their tires to ensure that the industry remains, or there is some kind of incentivization for the industry to be sustainable. So I think from a consumer perspective, uh, there's not a problem. I think the difficulty lies in how does one incentivize this industry to scale far more rapidly than what it has done for the last um, certainly seven years that I have been involved. I mean, we had the advent of uh, Redisa, uh, which was, uh, as everybody's aware, was a failure. The Waste Bureau took over uh, that um, position and have obviously tried to uh, bring on more and more companies, but there's just too many challenges in the industry for it to be scaled uh, sustainably. And I think that's where many of the issues lie. So I think, you know, people are very well aware of the, the problem. We're also well aware that many of uh, the tyres that are dumped have historically been in previously disadvantaged areas. Um, there's also this, this problematic, you know, with the, uh, with the weather and the very hot weather and the high amount of rains and the possibility for it to be not only an environmental problem, but also a health problem with the breeding of mosquitoes and harbouring of, uh, of mosquitoes and, and so forth also poses a problem to people's health. So, I think everybody's very conscious about it. It's just, you know, how the challenge lies in how can you sustainably incentivize this industry to scale rapidly and not in the manner that it has been done since uh, over the over the years. And I think also the legislation hasn't been possibly the friendliest. I mean, we've seen, I, I think since the demise of Redisa, there's possibly been four ministers of environmental affairs that have taken place and, and has there been a successful implementation of the industry tire waste management plan? No, there hasn't. There's been iterations, there's been changes, there's been public um, awareness campaigns, there's been debates, but still today we don't have a uh, tire waste management plan that has been successfully implemented. It's still the Waste Bureau who is providing um, who is not meant to be providing the 
the role of, of implementing it. They're meant to be there from a stewardship perspective. So, you know, I think with, with that kind of issue, it's going to always cause problems into the future. And I think, uh, and I hope that this year there may be some changes within government as, as far as the implementation of the industrial waste management plan, but I believe it when I see it rather. Can you discuss the rubber recycling process and describe its impact on the environment? Yeah, so from our perspective, obviously we were only focusing on radial track tires. So you have uh, a high rubber content and then you have a high, high tensile steel content. So I mean, just crude uh, percentages, 70% rubber, 30% steel. So we received the, the tires uh, from the waste brewer. They're brought to our facility. We check the tires to install, ensure that they are not have any metal pieces in them prior to it going into our factory. Once it's in the factory, the tires are beaded, which means that from the side wall of the tire, you remove the wire bead, uh, which is a big piece of wire on the side walls that's removed. That's packaged and um, compressed and ready for uh, export or, or, or sale to a furnace, which then recycles that steel. Then you have uh, the remainder of the whole tire. The whole tire is then put into uh, the commencement of the recycling process. The first stage is shredding, which is essentially large teeth that just rips apart that tire into uh, bigger pieces. From the bigger pieces, we start to reduce further the size of that material all the way to different sizes of crumb. Different sizes of crumb because different industrial end uses. But as we're reducing that size material, there's still a lot of steel within the tire that needs to be reduced. And this is pieces that are, um, we call it, it's high tensile steel, but it's shaved uh, material. So it doesn't come out as a whole piece. It's often cut into small pieces. That all has to be removed because obviously you can't supply any uh, rubber crumb material that has any steel content within it. So 100% of the steel gets removed. That's also then packaged and kept aside to be sold. But as we're going downsizing the tire, so we go from a shredder, we go to what we call a rasper, then we go to granulation, and then we go to milling. Milling is where you control the ultimate size of that material. And we manufacture a product that goes, um, that's very, very fine, that goes into new tires or retreaded tires. We have coarser material that goes into the roads industry. Then we have coarser material that goes into artificial turf as an infill, and then coarser material still that goes into the elastic layers uh, for different kinds of sports fields. So you have to control the size of rubber crumb. In terms of wastage, there's actually very little or no uh, wastage. Um, if you're looking at car tire material, then you have another problem. Uh, you have an additional waste stream, and that is a lot of the fiber or fluff that's in that material, which is a high percentage of that uh, tire that you have to also remove but it becomes a waste stream because really there's not too much industry uh, that utilizes that uh, material uh, or can be utilized to manufacture other products in europe we're seeing a lot more research uh, that's coming uh, out that that material can be uh, mixed with concrete there was some research uh, i think in the uk zn uh, port elizabeth uh, at Nelson Mandela University and at Stellenbosch University, we're looking at different ways of utilizing uh, some of that material. But from our perspective, we really have uh, zero waste. All, all the material that we recycle is converted either into steel, which is then sold. Uh, and, I, and interestingly, that steel is then shipped overseas. It's used in a, um, a furnace, uh, electromagnetic furnace, it's made, made into steel plates and then tends to be used back in the automotive industry. Previously, we were shipping a lot of material to South Korea and that got used in the ship industry. It's used to manufacture the hulls of uh, ships or into uh, was used in Hyundai at the time. Now, a majority of that material is going elsewhere. So we have little or no waste stream, 100% of the tire is converted into rubber crumb and steel. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our readers? You know, for, for a consumer to understand that uh, when they're looking at product that's manufactured from recycled rubber crumb, that it's not a simple process, a very involved 
process that uses uh, a large amount of energy and labor to create the product, but it certainly has benefits over the utilization of virgin uh, products and they can be utilized in industry and at home um, and the products that are manufactured from them uh, you know can be can be manufactured into all sorts of different products and obviously they're supporting uh, circularity and sustainability by purchasing those types of products that was mate group ceo dr Marin zarabini discussing the state of rubber manufacturing in africa and the latest developments in south africa's tire recycling sector